Good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Izu, and I'm the Executive Director of the California History Center at De Anza College and a member of the Advisory Board of the Japanese American Museum. I wish to welcome all of you to the museum and a special welcome to those of you who might be here for the first time. First, let me do the in-flight safety talk we need to do here. I've been told we have to do this. In case of an emergency, please take notice of where the exits are. There's one in the back, and there's one right here, and you go down there calmly, and, um, and you come out and get into the parking lot, okay? And then the bathrooms are downstairs, so when appropriate, you can use them. And um, please silence your cell phones. There's no flotation advice, uh, device under your seat, so if it floods, then you'll figure something else out. Okay, I think that's good enough. Tonight, we are venturing into something a bit different for the museum. We received a grant from the California Civil Liberties Public Education Program of the State Library, which was established to educate the public about the World War II mass incarceration of Japanese Americans, the massive violations of the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights that it represented. The program's goal is to promote important lessons about civil liberties that can be gleaned from this history. For our project, the museum is collaborating with my center at De Anza College, to J-Town Community TV, to make these lessons relevant and powerful so we may face the political storm engulfing our entire nation right now. One fueled by fear and hate mongering and scapegoating against immigrants and Muslim Americans in particular. At this time, let me introduce some of the principal players. One is Dwayne Kubo from J-Town TV. He's right behind the camera here. Um, and unfortunately, I think Michael Sarah, the president of the board, is downstairs checking people in with Jim Nagaretta, who is the executive director, but you will meet them later. Um, we decided to focus our project on the Japantown community and use the lens of local and regional history to make connections between two communities, Chinese Americans and Mexican Americans, that have shared this area with us going way, way back. We want to draw important parallels with each community's own historical experience facing storms of fear and hate mongering that resulted in exclusionary actions against them, violating our nation's most fundamental and basic civil liberties. And we want to use this history to inspire us to action today. We have conducted interviews and will record pub public programs, including this one right here. We wish to encourage the creation of more opportunities to share and connect and help our communities work together to face this most urgent situation. And we are beginning tonight with our local history groups and individual supporters. At this time, I'd like to recognize Dr. Consuelo Rodriguez, representing La Raza Historical Society of Santa Clara Valley, one of the groups we wish to work with in the future. And I believe there are some other representatives from that organization. If you're not familiar with this organization, um, she can wave her hand and you can take a look at her and so you can be sure to talk to her. Here. <clears throat> Our focus this evening is on Mexican Ameri the Mexican-American connection a connection we make with Japanese Americans and civil liberties lessons by a simple statement, I never saw my father again. To help us understand this connection, I would like to introduce Jiro Saito. I met Jiro many years ago, working with him in Japantown with the Nihonmachi Outreach Committee on the campaign for redress for the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans. Besides his involvement in the community, Jiro has worn many hats and has had second, third, and fourth careers including a stint as the chair of Asian American Studies at San Jose State, as a paralegal, as a postal worker, and in retirement as a scooter riding all around raconteur. <laughs> so, Jiro, if you would like to come up. Well, Tom, thank you very much for the introduction. It's really nice being here. I see all these familiar faces in front of me, so it's uh, like homecoming to a certain extent. Anyway, let me start off on the story that I, that I wrote and I delivered about, gee, it's been 16 years since I did this. And one of the things about, the sad part about that is, is that a lot of the things that were going on then, exclusion as Tom talked about, are things that haven't disappeared, still persist. And that to me is very sad and tragic. So anyway, let me go start my story. I was a little more than two years old when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and almost three when our family was taken from our farm in Otay, California, which is near San Diego, and we were taken to Santa Anita Racetrack. 
My memory of that time is largely the remembrances of my mother and sister. And tonight I'd like to tell you their story and mine. By the time I was born in 1939, my father and mother had operated a farm in Old Town for seven years. Only 10 of its 40 acres was arable. Papa had been a fisherman and decided that farming would be, a, would be a better way to earn enough money to move the entire family back to Japan. That was his plan. I had four sisters and a brother and was the youngest by 11 years, so I may not have been planned. <laughs> Mama helped out in the fields, but her main job, along with Kanta no Basan, our great aunt, was to do the cooking and clearing, cleaning of our home. Mama told me that once in a while, when she was at home, while everyone is out working, Mexicans who had crossed the border would come by, and she would make them sandwiches to take them with them on their journeys northward. My sister Yoshiko, who we call Yotan, said that on December 7th, she was stoking our family's ofuro, or hot tub, when one of the farm workers came by to tell her that Japan had bombed Pearl Harbor. She didn't know where Pearl Harbor was and told mom, Papa and Mama what she had heard. She didn't remember what her, their reactions were to the news, but guessed that they must, they must have been in shock and worried about my two sisters and brother who had left for Japan in 1940 to finish their education. As Japanese men were being taken into custody, Papa had a feeling that his turn would be soon. Yotan said that he had packed a small suitcase to be ready to go when the FBI came to pick him up. Yotan came home from school one day in late December and Mama told her that the FBI had come to take Papa away. They had also confiscated our family's butsudan, which is a small Buddha shrine that many families kept at home. Yotan could not understand why my father had been arrested. He was neither a Buddhist priest, nor a Japanese language teacher, nor a community leader. The only reason she could think of was that Papa had high school age children who happened to be American citizens living in Japan. The day arrived when our family had to leave the farm. Papa, while at the det detention camp in LA County, had told Yotan through a barbed wire fence that she would be responsible for selling what she could. So at the age of 15, she had to sell farm equipment at the, uh, that went at bargain prices and a year old truck that sold for $50. The things we couldn't store or sell would have to be left behind for anyone to take, like my red tricycle. An army truck came and took us to Santa Anita Assembly Center in LA County around a month later than other families in San Diego. My sister Itsuko had contracted measles and our family had been quarantined. Because of her illness, and the delay it caused, we had the truck to ourselves for the journey to Santa Anita. As we were leaving our farm, the truck stopped. One of the soldiers got out, and in a few moments, he returned to the truck. He handed me my red tricycle. At Santa Anita, we lived in horse stalls, whose thin walls did not allow privacy. Yotan told me that my mother would have to carry me away from the stalls at night because I would constantly cry, Otai Kaidi, Otai Kaidi, I want to go home to Otai, I want to go home to Otai. I never knew what Mama was thinking during those days. Her husband was gone, three of her children in Japan, she had lost her home, and now she had to put up with a crying boy who wanted to go home to Otai. Yotan said that she was peeling a red radish in our living quarters at Santa Anita when we received, a, when we received a stack of telegrams from Lordsburg, New Mexico. It just so happened that the telegram on top told about my father's death in the Lordsburg camp. His heart had given out. My mother saw the stunned expression on Yotan's face and she asked her what had happened. Yotan said that to tell Mama that Papa had died was one of the hardest things she ever had to do. 
Even now, she told me, she recalls what she felt that day whenever she peels radishes. My father's body was shipped from Lordsburg and his funeral took place at one of the smaller grandstands at Santa Anita Racetrack. I remember the close of the funeral when our family gathered around the casket. Mama was carrying me and she took me closer to the casket. She whispered for me to say goodbye to my father. I don't remember if I said goodbye or was even sad looking at Papa for the last time. I believe that at most I was confused over seeing his life with his body and about not going home. A few years after the war ended and we had returned to San Diego from Poston, Arizona, we took a trip to Old Time. The farm was under new ownership, but looked the same, according to Mama. I remember when we left the property, I could see the hills nearby covered with golden poppies. I returned to Otay again, but by then Mama had passed away, as had Kantanova san. My sisters and brothers had returned from Japan and had raised their families. I was married with my own family and lived in San Jose. The hills near our farm had, that had once been covered with golden poppies were now covered with homes. My life and the old tide that had been part of my childhood had both changed. But in hearing the cause for expulsion of some immigrants and imagining the feelings of dread and anxiety of young people threatened to be taken away from the only country they have ever known, I'm reminded of what happened to Papa, Mama, and the rest of us in Otai. And I say to myself, let no child ever cry out as one did in 1942, Otai Kaidi, Otai Kaidi. Thank you. Southern California to be with us this evening. Dr. Francisco Valderrama is a professor emeritus of U.S. History and Chicano Studies at Cal State Los Angeles. He is also co-author of Decade of Betrayal, Mexican Repa Repatriation in the 1930s, along with the late Raymond Rodriguez. Dr. Valderrama has spent many years educating the public about what happened to Mexican Americans in the 1930s, when a campaign based on fear and hate mongering led to an estimated one million being deported in violation of the U.S. Constitution, and an estimated 60 to 70 percent U.S. born children. He was involved supporting efforts to get the state of California to an issue a formal apology for this role in repatriation and mass deportations of Mexican Americans, which it did so in 2006, I believe. So without any further ado, uh, this is Dr. Francisco Valderrama. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, this is my second time here, and I really appreciate the invitation to be with all of you today. Um, and uh, I have an assistant, okay? Um, my spouse, Christine Valenciana, who also has done considerable work on the same topic. And so we are not only husband and wife, but we're also colleagues working on this topic. So you know we have a really strong marriage. <laughs> we talk about exclusion, and what I'd like to focus upon tonight is really what happens to men, women, and children and that we are seeing an attack on family life, historically and contemporarily. Many people are familiar with what happened to black Americans, African Americans in terms of slavery and the divisions of their families. Some people are also familiar with what happened to Native Americans and how those families were separated and their children were placed in boarding camps. What we have here is the case of Jorge Garcia, 
which just happened last January. Jorge Garcia, a resident of Detroit for 30 years, who came to the United States at nine years old, who's married to a U.S. citizen, who has children who are U.S. citizens, found himself being deported. He was too old to apply for DACA. We have an individual who's paid his taxes, has maintained a job, supported a family of U.S. citizens, finding himself today in Mexico, separated from his family. And with the threat of that family never seeing their father again. Uh, Christine, if we could have the next slide, thank you. Here is Esteban Torres, former congressman of the Southern California area, also very active in union politics in Southern California. Uh, Esteban Torres was raised in Arizona, in the mining districts of Arizona, and at three years old, during the Great Depression, his father was rounded up and shipped to Mexico. He grew up without his father. This happened during the 1930s when we find a mass expulsion of Mexican nationals and American citizens of Mexican descent. Our next slide, please. This is Ramona Espinosa, who was uh, deported from Los Angeles also during the 1930s when her father was in jail, arrested for a traffic accident. Uh, her mother and her siblings were on their way to Mexico. She would live 10 years in Mexico without her father. She also suffered all sorts of deprivations, starvations at certain points in life, also uh, developed stomach problems, because she was forced to drink water from containers that had once held gasoline. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me click in here. Okay. This is Jose Lopez. Jose Lopez, gratefully we could say, went to Mexico with the rest of his family. Living in Detroit, Michigan, his father found himself out of work. And the county there says, you have to go to Mexico where you can be with your own people, where you can speak your own language. But as we all know, you can do that in Detroit. <laughs> right? This poor man experienced malnutrition, uh, experienced uh, child labor, uh, lived in poverty for 10 years, finally was able to return to the United States during World War II, uh, tried to join the military, but was a 4F, which was a result of his living in these conditions in Mexico. His life project became, what happened? Why did it happen to my family? And he became a crusader in terms of bringing justice to the over one million Mexican nationals and American citizens of Mexican descent that were expelled at that time. <clears throat> Key at looking at this is this anti-Mexican hysteria. Basically revolved around the idea at that time that a Mexican is a Mexican. No distinction made in terms of residence. Most of the people during the 1930s that were expelled had lived in the United States for 15, 20, 25 years. And it contributed to the U.S. economy. Also, no distinction made to those that were U.S. citizens. So what we have occurring is a unconstitutional deportation of U.S. citizens. Over 70% of them were U.S. citizens. Next one. Expulsion by train, that was the means to do it. Key to looking at this in terms of, as we look at today, as it occurs to Jorge Garcia and others, is this simple fact. 
it was less the federal government. There was no deportation act by the federal government, which is the responsibility of the federal government to control borders and enforce immigration laws. Rather, what occurred in the 1930s is it occurred on the local level. Your private industry, U.S. Steel, Southern Pacific Railroad, Ford Motor Company, decided to ship people because they'd be better off with their own people in Mexico. And your local states and counties sought to ship people. Similar, for those of you familiar with immigration law and recent developments, when the states under the Obama administration of Arizona and, and Alabama sought to enforce immigration laws, that's what occurred. Whether it be the New Dealers under Roosevelt or the Conservative or the Republicans, they both groups, the right and the left, supported this. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. This is the key factor is U.S. citizens are deported. 70% were U.S. citizens, as I said. And that obviously played a key role in the Mexican community in the, in the development of Americanization. So as we can think of this time is, it's a lost generation. A lost generation. Some people are gonna be able to return, but it's few of them. Their lives are disrupted, totally disrupted. Next slide, please. Raymond Rodriguez, as Tom mentioned to you, co-authors of Decade of Re uh, Betrayal, um, was a very, very close friend and not just a colleague of mine, one of my trusted great friends. We knew each other for over 40 years. We worked together for about 25 years together. I worked with him on Decade of Betrayal, the first edition of the book that came out in the 90s and I had known him and his family very, very well. I knew he grew up without his father, but when we finished the manuscript, he told me, my father was a repatriate. That his father had been shipped to Mexico, he was raised alone by his mother, together with his other siblings. And writing that book was most obviously a search for his father. Next slide, please. It resulted in the 1995 edition of the book. The book was a great success, uh, adopted in a number of universities. Uh, I was very, very happy with it. And then the years went by, I was working on another project and a state senator from Southern California, Orange County, Orange County Joe Dunn read the book. And he started calling me, leaving messages. And many of you know about the fame of Orange County, kind of conservative area. He left me a lot of messages, and I didn't answer them. And finally, then I picked up the phone once. He caught me in the office, and there he was. We got to do something about this. I've never heard about this. Well, ended up he was a Democrat that represented Santa Ana, okay, with its huge Mexican population, and. Next slide, please. We were able to get, with Joe Dunn's help, legislation passed, an apology by the state of California for the expulsion that occurred in this state. And we have a memorial of that in Los Angeles at the LA Plaza Museum. There's also an exhibit there with oral history testimony from many of the survivors and many of those Mexican-Americans that were U.S. citizens. Next slide. And this is one individual, Emilia Castaneda, and I mention her because I'm just a poor historian conveying what happened, but as this museum does here, it's the testimony, it's the voices of those individuals is the power of the story. And Emilia Castaneda, that was uh, found herself expelled here, a U.S. citizen, I'm about to say deported, 
better yet, unconstitutionally deported, she was one of the leaders speaking on television, on radio, interviews in the Spanish language press and the uh, English press. It's voices like this that really got us the apology and the exhibit. These voices. Next slide, please. As well, I'd like to recognize, but there's many others, Ignacio Pina, an individual that at six years old, he was uh, looking forward with a brand new pair of jeans and a good pair of shoes to start school, like his older brothers and sisters living out in Idaho. And the sheriffs were at the door, they rounded up in custody, they placed him in jail, they rounded up his father, and interestingly enough, they put the father in one cell, in one part of the jail, and they put his mother and his brothers and sisters in another cell. And they're separated for a week or so with only the clothes on their backs. After a week, they find themselves on a train being shipped. They ask for their belongings, and they say, don't worry about it, we're going to ship them to you. They end up in Sudad Wadis and wait days and nothing comes. What's amazing with this individual is that he always remembered where he came from. He always remembered, like Emilia Castaneda, that they were from the US, that they were Americans, that they did not belong in Mexico. And it's their voices saying that story which brought about the apology. And it also tells us a lot about what an American is about. Uh, next slide, please. And as a result of their efforts, we revised and expanded the book, Ray and I, myself, to talk about this campaign for justice, and as a result of so many individuals that came forward to share their stories. There are stories of what happened to these men, women, and children. What happened to their families. Yes, we can talk about the laws. Yes, we can talk about the politics. But I think if we look at the families themselves, that's the importance of it. Uh, next slide. And this is a reflection of the power of the story. Right here you see the children of Bell Gardens Elementary School from Southern California. Bell Gardens Elementary School, there's a teacher there, a fifth grade teacher named Leslie Hyatt, and she read Decade of Betrayal, and she became engaged with the topic, and she thought about her students in the fifth grade, and thought about, well, what would resonate with them? What would they like? And she introduced the topic to them, and gave them the choice. Do you want us to give more attention to this topic? So these students started working on the topic. They, they developed groups, they developed uh, plays on the topic, they developed uh, 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 skits on the project, et cetera, et cetera. And this teacher happened to go to a school board meeting and talk to one of the school board members. It happens to be a former student of mine. I have former students everywhere, okay? And one right here. And, you know, it said, well, gee, I know Francisco. <coughs> so I got an invitation to the classroom. Myself, my spouse, Dr. Valenciana, and survivors, we came to the classroom. And I tell you, Christine could speak to you maybe more about this later, but for myself, I was so impressed. Those fifth graders knew more than my graduate students. <laughs> because that was a topic that resonated with them. Because they are, come from families of immigrants. That they themselves became captivated by that topic because for them, they live in that reality. And so the local uh, assembly person of Southern California then had a contest, this ought to be a law. 
And that's what took them to Sacramento. Those fifth graders that you see right there gave testimony that this ought to be taught in California schools. Now, myself and Dr. Valenciana and, and survivors have gone to Sacramento before, but when these children went and they gave testimony, four of them, fifth graders, spoke to an audience at least five times bigger than this one, gave testimony of three minutes each, and each child of that class came up to an open microphone and declared their support. My God, fifth graders, how powerful. Resulted in the passage of that legislation. And then other professionals, historians, Chicano scholars, and others, educators, also changed the framework. So you'll see it in textbooks that are being released. Not enough, okay, we got our qualms with it. But we're in there, we need to expand it. We need to do better with it. So now we have the textbook fight. Well, now we have the textbook fight. But so relevant and so important. Next one. Okay, this is the future. <coughs> We've talked about children here being caught in this situation. So I'm leaving you with this one child from the fifth grade class here and the role that she played. And I leave you with that because of my research and writing. Frequently I get asked the question, well, Dr. Balderrama, well, what do you think about it happening again? And what can we do? And usually my response is, well, we have coalitions. Coalitions and groups. Coalition and groups with other ethnic groups, like what we're doing here today with Japanese Americans, with others, with African Americans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Groups on the left, different labor groups coming together, shared ground, shared ex experiences, organizing to stop it. But what I think has been most powerful is these children. If we educate others, especially children, to understand that doing this to one group is wrong, and especially it's been done to so many other groups. When I began, I mentioned African Americans. I mentioned Native Americans. Obviously, with our focus here in this, this sacred ground here, this museum, Japanese Americans, Chinese. if the Chinese Americans, we can go down the list, right? That's our common ground. So with that, I leave you. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. And uh, we got kind of a twofer here with, with your wife and both of you. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, we are going to now have a panel discussion. And um, I'm going to introduce the panels. We have, of course, Francisco, but I already introduced him, and so you know who he is. Um, we also have Ahmad Rafiki. Rafiki. He's from the Council on American Islamic Relations, or also known as CARE, a Civil Rights and Legal Services Coordinator. He represents the San Francisco Bay Area chapter of CARE, which is the oldest chapter in the country. CARE was created to work to uphold civil rights of American Muslims, foster a better understanding of Islamic faith and its followers, and help find avenues for Muslims to integrate more fully into the broader society. CARE provides legal services, educational outreach, and conducts advocacy work. CARE is now at the forefront of defending Muslim American, Muslim American community in face of the massive upsurge of attacks upon them through the Trump administration. It seems that not a day goes by without CARE having to respond through the media. And next to me here is a longtime activist in the San Jose Japanese American community, former chair of the Nihon Machi Outreach Committee, active in the movement for winning redress and reparations for Japanese Americans. 
She is also the former vice chair of the federal level Civil Liberties Public Education Fund Board, established by the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, um, which was set up to educate the public about the issues of the wartime expulsion and incarceration. Susan is also a volunteer board member with the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. So we can give our panel a hand here. <laughs> so what I'd like to start off with is to give, you you have heard from Dr. Valderrama. Um, I'd like to uh, give uh, our two new panelists a chance to say something. So first I'd like to ask Ahmad to help us start the discussion off. If Ahmad, could you please help us connect the Muslim American experience to what you have heard this evening? Are there any stories you'd like to share from your work that might help us understand what is happening to Muslim Americans right now? Can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah. sounds like you can. Um, thank you uh, for the Japanese American Museum of San Jose for having us here. Um, um, I guess it's been uh, quite a reflective few minutes for me um, hearing uh, about the stories of, of those who survived the concentration camps, um, of those who, who have uh, family members who survived the repatriation or heard from family members like, uh, doc, like Professor Valderrama. Um, and I guess a few things have, have struck out in some of, the, some of the work that our organization has been doing uh, lately and for the last few decades. Um, and one of those things was um, how the state apparatus is used to vilify, target, demonize certain groups. And there always seems to be a flavor of the month, whether it is Italian Americans or Jewish Americans, Japanese Americans. And so the list goes on, like Dr. Uh, like Professor Valderrama rightly said. And it's often interesting that it often starts at the top with uh, politicians, for example, um, using and leveraging um, sort of uh, the current flair of the month. And, and, I, and I use this, and I was having a, a, a brief conversation with Professor Valderrama about this. It's interesting to me, especially with the Japanese American experience, um, that wartime uh, often tends to be a very, very good time to pick sort of uh, domestic enemies, quote unquote. Uh, in, in the Second World War, it was uh, the nation of Japan that the United States had declared itself at war with. And so it chose to see Japanese Americans as not quite American. Um, with a sort of the Mexican American experience, with with the sort of land battles with with Mexico, including the land that we uh, currently are in, um, you see again the the demonization of Mexican Americans is not quite American, um, and now with this sort of nameless, shapeless war on terror that tends to encapsulate mostly Amer um, mostly Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, South Asian communities, or MMSA as I, as we like to say it for short, um, to see them as sort of this fifth column. I use this word to say like. Not quite American. So we see this the same. We see from the the the, uh, the politicians who use the same terms to describe Muslim Americans as being traitors, uh, not American. The idea that Muslims have to be loyal to something other than the country, something more than, say, for example, their neighbors. Um, the same idea was used to Japanese Americans that they were loyal to Japan as an imperial power or to their religion. And I think one of the stories mentioned taking away of like shrines. You see this quite often with, for example, the FBI, when they visit the homes of Muslim Americans, and they look at sort of symbols of the faith and deem that to be something foreign, something dangerous. It could be something sim simple as a copy, uh, or a calligraphy that says the word God or, or the, the name of the prophet Muhammad, for example. Um, and so it's interesting to see how those, those simple images have been weaponized. Um, what also struck me uh, was um, this idea um, that you could um, sort of use exclusionary policies to uh, further domestic goals. And so we've seen that in um, the, the separation of families. We have family members who are no longer able to uh, reunite with family members. We know people who, uh, you know, who are US citizens and wanted to bring their spouses from overseas, from, from one of the countries, for example, targeted by the Muslim ban. And they're separated and they're struck in, uh, in, those, in those conditions. I speak of a family in Oakland of Yemeni origins. So the Yemeni Americans, all eight siblings are here in America, and so are the parents. And one sister was stuck in Yemen. Um, and then you, if for those of you who've paid attention, uh, the Yemeni civil war, often uh, conducted by America's great ally, Saudi Arabia, and funded by American dollars, for example, uh, closed the embassy in Yemen. And this family is now stuck outside of Yemen with no hopes of going back. Um, 
it's it's not so much that they that, that America has been home to them already, but the truth is simply by the fact that their family members, all of their family members, are here. There is nowhere else on uh, on earth that they could find sort of the comfort, the support that we all look for in family. And so um, it's been interesting for me uh, working in these cases and speaking to people about the parallel experiences of those who come before us, Japanese Americans, uh, Mexican Americans, to know that um, it's not so much just the flavor of the month, but um, that this is something we've seen before, the ways to defeat this are seen before. It's powerful to build coalitions. It's powerful for us to speak about this. But it's also important to know that without us being heard, you will often not have politicians um, sort of make any moves. California has prided itself as being a sanctuary state. But we know that's not quite true. We know that ICE, for example, has conducted many uh, raids in Northern California. Um, I'm reminded, I'm, and I'll just end with this, I'm reminded that Justice Earl Warren, uh, when he ran for um, California Attorney General, then prided him. He's known as one of the most liberal justices of the Supreme Court. And I grew up, uh, not grew up, but I went to law school hearing about him and learning about him. But he actually ran his campaign on kicking Japanese Americans out of California. That's a liberal justice. He went on to become uh, the Attorney General um, and then the Governor. And this is a reminder, like Dr. Uh, like Professor Valderrama said, that it doesn't matter whether it's liberal, uh, conservative uh, coalitions or, or politicians, but the, the important thing is that the people themselves uh, need to be separated. And I think it's important to understand America as an empire in the world and to separate that from the American people. Um, and so I think that's sort of what I've had to take away from this. Thank you. Thank you, Armani. Um, Susan, would you like to say something? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm third generation Japanese American, and I think that, uh, like many sansei, uh, you know, I grew up knowing my family's story. So uh, you know what the the thing is that everybody else knows. They know 110,000 Japanese Americans were taken from their homes and on the West Coast. But I think what what we really take to heart and really think about a lot is our our individual family stories and the individual family tragedies and uh, suffering that came out of the camps. And uh, because of that, I think we're very, uh, all our tear ducts are ready to go when we hear stories like, like Judo's family story. Um, it means so much to us, we can relate to it really personally. And so I think we're really, uh, we're really, um, ready to have deep compassion for other people's family stories. And sometimes when we hear uh, things on the news and we hear a news analysis, um, we kind of understand it, we sympathize with it, we, we feel angry or we feel we should support something or oppose something, but I think what really touches us deeply is knowing that some of the really fundamental things that Japanese Americans have gone through uh, with our families, that there are other families that have gone through that too. And that is, um, that's something that is very moving to me and I think it's very powerful. And I want to figure out how to take that power and really um, turn it into something um, big. Thank you, Susan. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna, before we start with a question and answer, regular question and answers, we're going to do something a little bit unusual to try to encourage um, people to participate. We're going to pass the basket, um, but I'm not going to ask for money. This is not that kind of basket. <laughs> in this basket, I have flowers and cranes. They're supposed to be symbolic, and um, Judy over here, Judy Dang, made, made them. And attached to them are, is a question, each one. And if you're willing to do this, you can read the question and we'll have you comment and other people can comment on this. But we're gonna uh, give some special preference to special guests here first. The first are these. If um, any of you here were incarcerated in one of the camps or detention centers by the US government, you know, forced Japanese Americans and others into, uh, please raise your hand. Any of you? Can we uh, give a round of applause to those people here? Right. So I'm going to ask Vernon. <laughs> can you pass this to Vernon? He's right there. You know, if, if you don't mind, you can pick whatever you want, a crane or a flower, and uh, tell me how can you give him the mics?
what are the most valuable lessons from the re re repatriation that you can help us today? Okay, so, oh, I forgot to tell you, you can keep the crane because it's going to come in after the reception. So, if you want. <laughs> um, so, uh, Vernon, would you like to say something in response to that? And then we'll get some other, other comments. question was, what are the lessons uh, from the repatriation that are valuable today? I wasn't ready for this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. So, um, what did the panel, would, would you like to say something about it? Yes, sure, sure, of course, yes. I'm a professor and I don't give quizzes at these events, okay, so I to, <laughs> and there'll be no examination. Uh, I, I guess what I would like people from today to kind of be sensitive to from, from coming here, and I really do appreciate you coming out and being here and you know, spending your time to address this issue, because it's not just a Mexican issue, it's not just a Latino issue, it's, a, it's an American issue for all of us. It's a, it's a universal thing. I, I think to be conscious of hysteria, um, I think uh, as we think about what happens to all these different people at different historical moments, there's an hysteria that, bro that breaks out. And, and people aren't making sense with their arguments, and their arguments don't make any sense. And there's a trampling of laws, there's a trampling of traditions. And the second thing is to be also ready to recognize when there's a lack of political leadership. And I think that's obvious, <laughs> right? You know, I'll have to, you know, walk out and check the news as you walk out of here. It'll be a, some other thing, right? The Trump administration, you know, some people were saying that something's happening every day that's crazy. Well, I think it's now every morning, afternoon, and evening. <laughs> so I think we, we have to recognize those things. And then thirdly, you know, you fought the traffic, you had to look for parking, you had to park the car, you had to get up here. Maybe some of you ate your dinner quickly, or maybe some of you are still hungry, thinking about when's it gonna end so I can eat something. <laughs> well, you're here, and I really appreciate that. But use this to, you know, fuel everything that's been said here, these stories that we've shared here of the different groups, different people, today and yesterday, the different ethnicities, and do something. Do something. That demonstration that you got on the calendar, and said, I don't know, I don't want to go. Maybe not now, do it. Write that letter, send that donation for that candidate, that political party, that group, do something. You'll feel good. Do something. Um, I think that there's something uh, that we could learn from the repatriation experience. So for Japanese Americans and also for Chinese Americans, I think our experience is, okay, all of you out, right? Everybody was taken at the same time or everybody was excluded. So I think what we can learn from the repatriation is that it's still an injustice, even if not every single person is taken, right? Because I think, uh, so with, same thing with the deportations now and the deportations then, it wasn't like they rounded up every single last person, but it's still an attack on your people, an attack on your community, right? And I think for Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans, our experience was a little bit more straightforward, right? It was like everybody on the West Coast or everybody's excluded from entry, right? So I think that's something that we should think about that um, don't get caught up, you know, don't get stuck on that issue, right? I think that the, the deportations are part of this demonization, right? And, and that's one thing that, you know, uh, Sometimes people say, oh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and suddenly everybody hated the Japanese. But I think you know, there were decades of anti-Japanese 
hatred and um, there were decades of anti-Mexican hatred and there have by this time been decades of anti-Muslim, anti-Arab American hatred and I think that when that is happening all the time it makes it easy to do something to that people in that group so I think that's something that I think is a lesson. Okay, we're going to pass the basket one more time. Um, this time, is anyone here related to someone you knew personally who was deported or directly impacted by the repatriation campaigns described by Dr. Balderrama? Do you? Wow. So let's give them a hand, please. Which one of you would, one of you would like to uh, pick a question? Could, do you mind reading it? While you're recording. Um, if we all join together, we could be stronger. So what keeps us apart? Yeah. If you'd like to say a comment on that, or we can have other, the panelists talk. Um, well, I really appreciate, uh, since February, I came to the events in remembrance um, of Executive Order 9066, and uh, seeing the, the conversation revolve around the issue not only of, of the concentration camps on Japanese Americans, but as well as um, the current detention centers that are being used on, on the immigrant population and how that is so much related um, for many Japanese that, uh, Americans that were speaking on that day about how they were feeling the same emotions as they see uh, right now uh, the, the, the people being rounded up into these uh, deportation centers. And I teach in the Salinas Valley, and for me, um, working with my students, it's very painful. <laughs> my great grandpa was repatriated from Monancy, Arizona, and uh, a lot of my family ended up in Jalisco. And uh, you know, like I look at the lives of my my children, and how you know today, you know, the, the, our brown youth continue to be criminalized. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the Salinas Valley, we keep on having meetings with our parents and our students. I have students coming up to me asking me, Ms. Valera, what are documents do I need to fill out in case my parents don't make it home? And I have to call the school district asking them, like, what, what do I tell my students? You know, and, you know, because of legality, we're not able to give them, you know, the advice. And so now the school districts are creating these meetings where they're creating packets for the parents in case of deportations and it's very peaceful. You know, in the Salinas Valley, we have our, our farm working communities. And you know, for me, I appreciate what the Japanese American community is doing by having these workshops and having these conversations because it's very much needed in the communities that I serve in. And I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate it. Um, would anybody on the panel like to make a comment? Personally, I'd like to just let it stand on its own. It's been very powerful, and I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, do you have any? Uh, well, let's open up to questions. So, any anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Question I have is, you know. When we were fighting for redress, we focused on Congress. And it seems as though the focus should be on the Supreme Court, that we should draw to their attention, because they're about to make a decision on DACA, which is just a small part of the history that has gone on this country. And I don't know that the Supreme Court is aware of America's history. Yes. And they should be made aware if they're not aware. And I think we should do it immediately because they're going to make a very important um, decision. But the bottom line of all the problems in America, I believe, is racism. You know, what, who is an American? You know, and our president has described an American as being white, Anglo Saxon, and rich. If you're poor, if you're uh, other than white, you're not desirable. And we're allowing him to make that description. But I think our first 
battle should be focused on the Supreme Court because they're about to make a decision. I think your comment is, is very, very important that uh, you made the comment that rich and white, and when you say white, we, we're not including white trash because those people are not white. And I think, I think what we're talking about is that uh, ordinary people, working class people, are not a part of the administration, only being used as, as, a, as a way to, to get votes, okay, but not serving those interests. Um, yes, at the Supreme Court, there, there's been a history, and if you think of the cases that have gone before the Supreme Court, many of the lawyers have had to educate the Supreme Court. So if we go back and look at the, legis the legal history of different cases that have come, that a lot of people don't understand that. And I think that's gonna be part of it, but we all know the composition of the Supreme Court. We all know what happened uh, with the Obama uh, power of trying to appoint somebody to the Supreme Court and uh, the new appointee of the Supreme Court. We all know the balance of the Supreme Court. Um, I think the, the only thing we can think about, I think that the only thing I, I wake up and think about is the election of 2018. And I, I think that's, I mean, that's what has to be done. I mean, that's the only, only thing. You know, I mean, I think that's it. The power in Congress, that's all, all we got going. And I think, you know, to resistance has to be done on that level. Uh, frankly, in terms of this particular issue of repatriation and getting to address, at one time we did uh, have sponsors in Congress. We did have people that were pushing it. But uh, the environment in Congress is not going to be supportive of anything like that. And um, so th that's, that's what we're left with. But that's where institutions like this are so, so important. Museums like this, classrooms as well, all other areas, because we have to continue to educate people, inform people, and move people towards activism. So as, as many of you know, because you live a life like that, um, activism is struggle. And that's, that's just a part of it. But the rewards, you know, can be great. You know, um, uh, Tom and I went to uh, the Rowards Rome pilgrimage a couple weekends ago, and they asked us to give a, a, a workshop on uh, the redress movement. And one of the things that uh, Tom and I were both involved in the redress movement in the 1980s. And uh, one of the things that Japanese Americans, who are a very tiny minority, um, had to do at the beginning of the Reagan era, which is you know, a move to the right, um, we realized that we had to create as powerful a movement as we could uh, to activate the most people in our community to come out and testify in front of the commission and to uh, really uh, mobilize as many people and to also uh, um, build coalitions with, with other people. So I kind of think that uh, a lot of us are kind of poised on the edge of something because you know with this election and with the the rise of anti-immigrant fervor that hits everybody even if we're american citizens um i think that people more and more are realizing that we have to uh do something right and and i think the the reason that we wanted to have a forum like this is so that we could meet each other outside of our own communities meet each other and try to figure out what we could do together and be more powerful than we would have been if we just stayed in our little group. So um, I, I hope that uh, we can uh, have conversations and meet each other and, and try to brainstorm. So. Yeah. Uh, question. 
Oh, I just wanted to, because my father actually lived in Tijuana. He was a Mexican citizen. And he was there when the Mexicans were thrown back over the border. And he was a young child at the time, so I thought his story might he would share something. <laughs> you know, attending this particular event <coughs> is very symbolic to me because I was fortunate enough to be born and raised in Tijuana, which is right across the border. But some of the things that you people talk about, they really hit my heart. And you know, because there's so much injustice in this world that is really pathetic. I have a lot of good friends that went to school with me in Tijuana, and they were Japanese descent. You know, these families, they had beautiful farms from Tijuana all the way up to La Paz. And I was so sad when suddenly, well, there's a lot of other points, you know, right now I'm speaking about the Japanese. But I, I noticed that the United States decided to gather all the Japanese and put them in concentration camps. Well, guess what? The politicians in Mexico were so rotten that they decided that it was a good move, you know, for the United States to do that because Mexico was in danger. We had to put all the Japanese somewhere. Well, the only reason behind that purpose was to take their properties to take over their lands, which is what I saw, you know, and I was, I was just a little kid, I was, well, I was born in 1930, but in this, all this occurred in 1930 to the 40s. So when I, was, when I was 10 years old, I noticed, for instance, when they, when they sent the Japanese and put them in concentration camps here, they did the same thing in Mexico. But all the politicians that we knew for a fact that they were corrupt, they took over their properties, their lands, their business, everything, because they were helping the movement to control and to safeguard the continent. That was a lot of crap. You know, and, and I was one of the first ones, you know, when I, when I, well, I was in the school, I was just a kid, you know, and when I saw some of my young friends disappear, you know, I started telling the teachers, I said, no, wait a second, you know, how come you guys never talk about this? This is some justice, this is not human. It's, why do you guys allow it? Nobody says nothing. I said, well, you gotta keep quiet because here you're, you're gonna be classified as a radical. And in Mexico, we don't need people that are radicals or speak against our own government. And I said, well, you know what, I don't give it then. You guys can put me in jail if you want to, but we got to use our common sense and our conscience. We have to learn to respect. Well, the same thing happens with a lot of the Mexicans that I met when I was going to school. Just, just listen. Some kids in the school with me, seven, eight, nine years old, they were all Mexican looking. And we, and they will, they, they, I, I, I will ask you, you knew, you knew here in the school, you know, what, what are, uh, they, uh, I speak to them in Spanish, of course, you know, de que parte de eres, por qué no hablas español? What? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I don't understand. Yeah, you don't understand because you're ashamed to be a Mexican. Uh, you don't want to be, don't be, don't, don't be ashamed, I mean, we are a friend race here. No speak Spanish. And then they incorrectly would say, Yo no me mexicano. I'm not a Mexican. They say, Well, are you sure you're not a Mexican? You're not blonde looking, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, these things happen, and I saw them, and they never leave my heart or my mind. I always, some of my best friends in Mexico were Japanese. And when I, when I went to Mexico City to study, I was walking on one of the main avenues in, in Mexico, and I was walking with my mom, and then, and then I said, Mom, there's Sergio, Sergio Nonaka. He was a Japanese kid that went to school. And he says, Mijo, he was in, he's in a concentration camp, you don't even deal with him. 
They said, Mama, I don't give a damn care what anybody thinks. This is wrong. So I called him, and he came over and we hugged each other. And then they said, well, so what are you doing here? I said, he says, I'm, I'm in a concentration camp. And so is my family, but they allow me to come out and beg for money mm -hmm. so I can give it to them. And I said, oh, boy. You know, Mother, I said, Mother, let's take selfie with us. He said, Mijo, we can't go against the government. We can't do that. He has to stay here. <coughs> well, I never saw him again. Mm. But you know, those things, honest to God, you know, they still hurt me. I can't believe it. So much cruelty, you know, in the, in the world. And how can human beings be like that? It was incredible. We, like me, making fun out of some of the Mexicans that were deported over there and like, they couldn't speak Spanish. Well, they had a reason, but I didn't understand it. And it was, well, that, that's what, all I can say. Thank you for allowing me. Um, I think what we'll do is take one more, either comment or question. Anybody have one? Oh, Connie. Well, you know, I really appreciate the message of the, all the panelists and everyone here, and it is that we all have to do something, that activism comes from in, it, in all forms. I have a specific thing, since we talk about the election being so important. You know, we have to do something about voter education and getting people yes. to register. We must, we yes. must, and to, to let people know that that naturalized immigrants have the right to vote. You know, and, and anyway, I'd like to just uh, ask you, uh, you know, what could be done and what is being done on this, in this area? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Um, I, I know that there are a lot of uh, immigration attorneys w working with uh, immigrants, and a lot of people are applying for citizenship. But I don't know if there is a lot of uh, new citizen voter ed, actually. I don't know about that. No, there is. Yeah? There is, yeah. yes. Oh, you speak to this. Yeah. No, I, I am. Um, no, I belong to a community organization called PACT. I don't know if you, any of you real know that. People acting in community together. And we're uh, a really diverse group. We have every ethnic group, every religion and, that come together. And every time we have elections coming up, we go out and, and register people. So we've registered a lot of people. Uh, there, we have over 50, more than 50,000 families in this area that belong to that. So when we, we have an action or uh, we have an issue, we form an action and we all come together and it really makes a difference, working together, which is what we all, we're, uh, you know, saying we should do. So that's, we're doing that right now. I was going to say that I feel like new citizens are probably the first ones that go vote, actually. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the people who have been here for a while, the second, third, fourth generations. To me, the best way you can push voting is to talk to all of your family members yeah. and everybody you work with and ask them, are you voting? Are you voting? And oh, yeah. I don't care if you gotta shame them about it. <laughs> Cause it's, it's these people that don't vote. It's the new citizens are usually very proud to vote. Yeah. And they're the first ones yeah, there. Sure. But it's a lot of your own children and your own siblings and family members that are not voting. So talk to them. Um, hi, Consuelo Rodriguez, um, Doctora Consuelo Rodriguez, UCLA graduate. <laughs> um, three things, yes. We've got to get out there, and my dear friend Betty Martinez is getting a group going together and, and getting them to register, and we have to go out and get the people that are afraid yeah. to come out. Mm -hmm. Not just us here, but those that are, you know, reach out. Um, the second thing is, I'm gonna, op oh, I'm on the board of La Raza Historical Society, and one of the things we're doing is documenting the contributions of the La Raza 
people to this community because we found out nationally that they didn't recognize in the comments where that, well, what did Mexicans and Latinos contribute to the growth and, and, and processing of this valley? You know, what did Mexicans contribute to this valley? So that's part of our organization to document, to collect data, to collect information, and um, hopefully we'll have a museum. Hopefully, <laughs> 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 taking. Uh, the third thing is I'd like to open another area, the racism. We have to look at racism, but we have to also look at classism. And I, fortunately, at UCLA studied under Dr. Charles Cheng. And Dr. Cheng died much too early. And when I heard him talk, I knew I wanted to study under him because he said he would only work with change agents, activists. That's all he would work with on the doctoral program. And his philosophy is if you're not gonna go out there and make change so that this is a better world to live in, not just for your little family, but for all of us. If we're not all free, we're not free. Right. So his issue was to look at classism because the research he did, and if you look at the documents, you know, in the Constitution, it pushes, it demonstrates clearly the goal is upper class, lower class upper class, lower class. The problem we're having today is that you all, us all, are now middle class. They weren't counting on that. <laughs> Thank you. What we're, do, well, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna transition into our reception. And you'll have a chance to ask questions of our panelists here, and hopefully talk amongst yourself. We are leading them out the emergency exit so they will go down to the reception so you guys won't trap them in here and not go to the reception yourself. Instead, you have to listen to me just for a moment while they make their way down there. Um, I'd, I'd really like all of you, hopefully, to come to the reception. Um, and I'd like all of you to think of yourselves as all future collaborators. Uh, how to bring communities together, how to think of creative ideas we can start working. We're just for a small group here, but amongst us, maybe you'd have some ideas, and then maybe we could do some other activities in the future together with whatever organizations you know of. So that, that's our hope, that all of you can uh, take part in that. And we also, down in the reception area that um, won't tell you how to get there, um, we have a little interactive art project, so to speak, that Judy made that involves the cranes and the flowers and writing a message and hanging it on this tree. So you all see it down there. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna go out that door and Tomio right there, he's standing there. <laughs> you follow him down the stairs or the elevator and once you get down there, you go through the exhibit gallery and you can take a quick look and you can always come back to the museum and spend more time there go out the door and you'll, 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 uh, people will show you where to go. And please um, talk with each other, uh, share more stories, and if you have any great ideas, talk to any of us, or if you find somebody, you can come up with a great idea, I hope. And so I'm going to end this part of our formal program and thank all of you for coming, we really appreciate it.